Bienvenidos a otro episodio más de La Vuelta. Soy Denis Rivera. Hoy tengo de invitado a Slash Venom, Flash Flanagan, como lo quieran conocer, un tremendo amigo y un eh, luchador de Estados Unidos, de Indianápolis, que hoy va a ser mi invitado. Antes de comenzar, le quiero decir que nos pueden seguir por nuestras redes sociales, por el nombre de La Vuelta, en Twitter, en Facebook, Instagram y nuestro canal de YouTube como La Vuelta. Así que te puedes suscribir, deja tu comentario, déjanos saber. Tus críticas son todas aceptadas. Así que sin más preámbulos vamos a comenzar con nuestro invitado de hoy. Eh, es un buen amigo de hace mucho tiempo y es una tremenda persona, un gran luchador que tiene muchas historias, pero vamos a, tra vamos a tratar de mantenerlo más corto y vamos a tratar también de hablar de, de la persona, no tanto del luchador porque es un buen amigo. So, brother, slash Venom, thank you to, for being here in... In my podcast, that's this is my new thing right now that I'm retired from wrestling. That's, that's this is what I do. So, you're thank, retired for now until that next time. No, until you fully get away from it, you're never fully retired. Trust me. You'll well, be back in the ring eventually. No, I don't yeah. think so. But hey, that's that's uh, this is my podcast, man. I'm supposed to interview you. I do the question, not you. So <laughs> behave, man. Behave. <laughs> hey. Um, first of all, everybody knows you here in Puerto Rico, you know, for, for your wrestling days in the IWA back in the days, back in the late 90s, early uh, 2000s. The crazy stuff you did, you did uh, in the ring, um, the famous uh, balcony throne from, with Ricky in the match, you know, all those stuff. But... People know that about him, and and that's cool because that's that's why he worked in this business for to entertain you guys and and to give you moments that you never forget. But the person, man, behind all all that craziness, the person you know behind all that, who is Slash Ben? Or who is Flash Flanagan? Well, who is the guy from Indiana? Who is he? Well, when I grew up, I was going to the shows and everything. I'd go to WWF and NWA, WCW. And every time I'd go to a show, I, I, I always wanted to be a pro wrestler. And it was like sitting in the crowd watching, I always wanted to say, when I became a wrestler, wanted to make sure everyone that bought a ticket, at least if they didn't like the show, that when they watched me, they felt like they at least got their money's worth. So I always went out there. Then you could see times I'd come to a show and I'd hurt, I'd hurt and everything. But when the bell time came, it was like, it's ready to go. It's gold time. It's ready to go. They, they bought a ticket, and I always want to make sure they got their money's worth. And I hope I gave you guys your money's worth. <laughs> okay, uh, we know that because all of us start in this business because we were we were fans. We saw it as a kid, and we say, "Damn, I, that's fucking cool. I want to do that. That that that's great. You know, that's I want to do that." Okay, but when you uh, decide to to get inside this business. What was you, your first school? Who taught you the, 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 your first moves? Uh, when I got when I got started, there was a local guy, he was a local wrestler in Indianapolis area. And he wrestled as Quicksilver, and then he brought Rip Rogers in, and then Rip, they Rip tortured me. He just he beat me to death. Rip, Rip Rogers uh, have a great run here in Puerto Rico, and used yeah. to be I think I think he used to uh, do commentary too in some shows, and he used to be a great fucking heel. I remember, you know, his big mullet and, and stuff. <laughs> eh? Look, cool stuff back in the day. Continue, but, please. But he tortured me, and it was just basically because I was I was a scrum. I was 175 pounds when I started. All right. I, I just I was in high school, and he tortured me, and it was basically because I was so small. It was to see if I really wanted to be if I was either going to stick with it or or, or, to, or quit. And. All right. He, I, I'm, he chopped me. He, he chopped me, and it's like I was blistered from one side of my. I was purple and bleeding, purple. split open. And it, I showed up the next day, and he was like, "Well, I guess you want to be a pro wrestler because a lot of guys you give just them. Go. You just, when they you see, everyone's all of a sudden it's all fake, and that's the worst thing I hate because you know how it is being chopped. I know. You know, just a chop. He's like, God, it hurts. Yeah. Running the ropes when you're starting out, it hurts. It hurts. And uh. It's, it's business, business isn't made for everybody. Guys think, oh, I can go out there and do that. I'm like, yeah, all right, just get in here, and I'll just have you run the ropes for a little while, and then say you feel the next day. And, and it's like you say, but a lot of guys nowadays, 
in Puerto Rico, uh, sadly, and United States, a lot of places, they think that they can do this and they just maybe they bought a ring and, and, and they kept some gear and they start doing stuff. It looks awful and I hate that because it, it kills our business that, that we love, that we learn from good people that, that earn their, their respect in this business. And see this, this guy sometimes, you know, it, it makes you mad in, in some way. Well, then a lot of guys, unless you're a WWF, a big star there, they like, I had a developmental deal and they don't realize like a lot of guys, I help train and give them advice and help out. And then it's like, now I, I try to help out with the younger guys and give them advice. Say, hey, this and this. You might try this or try that. And uh, they look at you like, well, what do you know? And I, and I, I think about it, like, man, is that guys just don't respect the business like the way I, like the way I was brought in. And I know how I was brought in. It's like you respect it. And, like, the guys that have been around you respect them. They may not have, they may not have got their break. Yeah. But there are guys that are very talented that are really good that you don't know of. And you sit there and you're like, man, this guy knows what he's doing. Brad Armstrong was one of the best wrestlers ever. And he never really got that big break. But you ask anyone that in, in, knows the wrestling business, Brad Armstrong was one of the best. So after you know all this training, you've been uh, doing little shows like everybody's starting, little shows, little cars you know, here and there. But you got your big break from the uh, development uh, development uh, place in no, actually, o OBW, right? No, uh, Jim Cornette. Jim uh, Cornette. Ricky Morton and Tracy Smothers had been pitching my name to him for a while. and but used to be Flash Flanagan in, yeah. in those days. In, in the States, Flash in the States, Flanagan, Flash, Flash, Flash and Puerto Rico. Flash and Puerto Rico. But, uh, we'll talk about that later. <laughs> but uh, Cornette called me up. They were doing the Super Bowl wrestling show. And they had The Undertaker. And this is when Kane was Unabomb. And Shawn Michaels was there wrestling Buddy Landell. And uh, I'd, worked, I'd wrestled the Headbangers a lot, but uh, he needed a match for them. And I, from what I've heard, the Steiners were supposed to come in, but they ended up, there, something fell through, and he needed a replacement. So he gave me a call on short notice. And he was like, hey, I got a spot here for you. I've heard good things about you. Could you make it? I'm like, yeah, I'll be there. This is my first break in the wrestling business. So... I started up at Smoky Mountain at their Super Bowl of Wrestling show, and that was in like ninety, seemed like ninety five. And I'd only been in the business about three years at the time, so like, yeah. So I got in there, and Cornette liked me, and then uh, he didn't have a spot though full time, and I'd call him up, hey, you got anything? And he'd bring me in occasionally, and then he brought me in full time in November that year, and I was like, oh, this is great. So uh, I, I, he built me up. On, I started out on TV wrestling Tommy Rich. Wow. And uh, so, how 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 is to to work with uh, such a great uh, mind of wrestling, such a historian of wrestling like Cornette? Because I'm a I'm a great fan of his, of his. I listen to his podcast like uh, every fucking week, like two three times a week, and 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 he's a uh, you know he got so many stories. He knows about he, he knows so much about this business. He he loves and we. Respects this business so much. Well, if, if you would go out there and you do something stupid, and he would explain to you, don't do this, don't do that. And then if you ask questions, hey, what do you think about this? And it wasn't right. He would explain. No, you go from this point to this point. Blah blah blah. That, that's the, the the intelligent part of it, because I'm telling you, don't do it. But I'm telling. At the same time, I'm telling you, like, don't do it because of this and this and this. I'm telling you the, the do and don'ts and the reasons why, why you, you shouldn't do that, you know. And, and but you would learn. Yeah, and yeah that's, that's the way to Then to you teach. make If you made mistakes, he'd help you out. It's like with Rip. Rip is the same way. And, and guys would tell me when I was younger, like, oh, you do this, you're going to feel it later. Your knees are going to be yeah. messed up and all that. And now I do. Now I am feeling it. It's yeah, like, we all know. We all, it's a, I'm cloning in that, in that bus, too. Uh, the one give person, me a ride in there. The one person you cannot beat is Father Time. He beats you every time. <laughs> but uh, got in there with Smoky Mountain. And then once the things were going good, it was like out of nowhere. I get the phone call. They were shutting down. And I went through a hard time there for a little bit. But then a few months later, I started up full time with USWA. And as I got in there and the uh, the rock was there he was getting ready to finish up and start full time we, we stay what that was that oh man it's, it was 
USWA? I'm, uh, what territory? What, what part USWA of the- was in, I was uh, Memphis, Nashville, Louisville, Evansville, and then you do spot shows in Arkansas, Mississippi, and stuff like that. All right. And uh, I was doing the Saturday, I was doing Nashville and Louisville at the time. So just like out south right? That's yeah. South. So I was just doing those shows. And then when The Rock was finishing up, I came in and replaced him full time. And his last day was my first day doing live television. Because they did live TV every Saturday morning. You do TV that Saturday morning, then you go to Nashville Saturday night. And, and how do you feel in, in, in that day, you know, that the big break or one oh, of the biggest uh, breaks? Well, I, I had known some of the guys. I, I had worked, wrestled a bunch of them in some of the local shows All around. Right. So I knew most of the guys there. But uh, getting my foot in the door again because I knew... WWF was still connected with them. They would send guys down. Then uh, I was there for about a year and a half. Then they closed up. And then Burt Prentice, it was it wasn't long after that. He started up doing Music City Wrestling. And I had been working for Burt in Arkansas. He had an his, uh, Ozark Mountain Wrestling. But I uh, got in there, Bert, and I'd known Burt for a long time. So I working now. I'm working his Nashville. He's running Nashville. So I got to do all those areas. Then uh, Cornette came into Louisville because I was still doing OVW stuff. And then uh, Cornette came to OVW, and that's when they started bringing developmental in. And they had their developmental guys. And there was, there was Rico Constantino, and there was John Cena, Batista, Orton, Lesnar. Let's see. Did I say Shelton Benjamin? Shelton. Shelton Shelton was there. Yeah. And uh, there was a bunch of talent, but... Uh, They just weren't harnessed yet. They, but so we were teaching those guys. I mean, there, me, there was me, Nick Dinsmore, Rob Conway, Doug Basham, Damage, who was Danny Basham. He was one of the Bashams. But we were basically teaching these guys. And then, uh, they were green. Yeah. Well, some of them had no experience at all. Rico, he'd only had a handful of matches when he got signed. Wow. And uh, Rico was very talented. He for, he won American Gladiators, and he not only did he just win the Gladiator, he dominated. I mean, I because when Rico got there, I remember watching him as a kid, watching him as a kid on American Gladiator just go through and whip everyone. He broke uh, Turbo's leg, I think it was Turbo, and uh, I don't know if it was the wrestling, but he met, he he just dominated, and he won right. he won that. And for some reason, I don't know why, when they brought Rico up, they did not do. Anything about American Gladiators? Talk about American Gladiator thing and how Rico was—he was good. And I got stuck with Rico when he got started out and it was get him going. And uh, I told Cornette, I was like, "He's good and ready to go." And then after Rico, I got Orton, and I had to develop Orton because Cornette asked. Him. He's sitting there. Orton, he, he had a background because of his father. He maybe nothing. Or he, or just, he became like green. I want to go in after he he deserted the Marines, he, and he came to the business and like. Dad made the phone call, got him in there, and then uh, Randy. He was a pudgy kid when he got there, but he busted his butt, got himself in shape, and he be, his ass off. yes, he became one of the best. I mean, he's really good. And how about, uh, uh, how about Lesnar? Lesnar was just a freak. I mean, you looked at Brock yeah, and you, anatomically, he's a you look at him and you say, okay, Brock Lesnar and Batista, they're going to make a lot of money because they look like a million dollars. And uh, but Brock had to. Brock was overcoming, trying to get transition from amateur wrestling yeah. to pro wrestling, which is completely different. Yeah, so, different but he I did, and then. Uh, When he did that, the shooting star press. I remember when he did. He would do that, and it was like, oh my god! Here's, here's three. Here's a 300 pound jacked up monster. Just the shooting star press, better than guys that are 150 pounds. I mean, it was the crazy. It was sweet. He he flew in the air, and I mean, he put him in the middle of the ring. That's the famous uh, shooting star he tried to to did. To yeah, do in, in WrestleMania with Angle, he almost king oh, yeah, killed himself. Yeah, he, he took it bad, badly on the, on that, the head and neck. That I'm just assuming that he he had never done it that long into a match. Yeah, because and then probably kind of that the condition wasn't the same. Sweating and he slipped, and yeah. just, he got lucky. He got lucky. He's alive, but uh, or not paralyzed. Yeah, but uh, Brock was just you knew he was going to be a special talent, 
So got, keep the train with all these guys, and now even John Cena, that right now is like the John the, Cena. The, we knew he wasn't the the greatest wrestler. Still is. The well, he he wasn't. The, he wasn't that good. He's the wrestling part wasn't great. But he could get on the mic. He can talk like a motherfucker, right? The best on the mic. He he, he could, he's still one of the best. You can loving s- him, hate him. The guy is good. In well, the you mic. can you can sit here and okay, me and you versus Mario, and he caught and a, bam, he come out talk him. about him, wrestling Super Mario and ready to go. He was he was that good on the mic, and I, I couldn't see anyone touching him. Right. Then uh, his his wrestling. His mechanics was yeah, awesome. they were weren't the greatest, yeah. but he's good. I mean, you can't. And, sit back. and you know, it, he's been on top for he's been on top for twelve years, I think, longer than that. I mean, he's been the top guy. So he's the, the biggest money drawer. Well, Brock Lesnar right now is six hundred thousand dollars a match, and a hundred thousand dollars per appearance, just to to be in the ring and Paul Heyman talk from for him. That's hey, that's money, bro. Can't knock it. And you know, you teach all these motherfuckers. You know, these, these big names right now in the business, and and that's why I'm I'm I feel so lucky to have you as a friend because I know you're a great guy. I know you are. I met you when you started. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You school me too. That's why you know, and you're a hell of a friend, a hell of a person. You know, and uh, that's why I want to do this with you. And and I haven't seen you for almost. Eight years, ignore, I think. Ignore that good person. I'm a bad. I'm, I'm mean. <laughs> yeah, but he was my bad person. You know, he was my good bad person, and he still is. You're you know? ruining my reputation here. Hey, you're still a great fucking guy, man. And and you know, after all this experience, you came to the you came, you came to Puerto Rico. After all these years, you've been with, with all these guys, all those big names in OVW over there. And you did, you did good. You 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 appear in WWE for a while, right? In a couple of dark matches and stuff. I, I was doing dark matches, and it just I wasn't. I didn't have my six pack abs and shredded up muscle. All yeah, the, 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 the type of body that like, they usually want to work with. I just wasn't their their typical cookie cutter guy. Yeah. Here's off the assembly line. Okay, boom, we just printed this guy up. Here's the next guy. Here's the next guy. Yeah, probably you were a wrestler and, and they wanted a performer like they called They wanted, they yeah. wanted, well, you look at everyone now. Yeah. Trunks, they all wear the same kind of trunks. They all look exactly they alike. They all look the same, bro. The, the, the moves are good, but doing that, I like, I like watching it. I, I don't tell you the truth. I'm a fan, but their careers are going to be so short. And I'll never forget Jim Ross coming back. He was sitting there having a conversation with us. And he's talking about Austin and The Rock at WrestleMania. And he's talking about how here these guys got, they each one of them made over a million dollars that night. Not one of them went to the top rope. And I was like, you know, you don't really think about it, but a million dollar payoff and you never have to go to the top rope. That's good. That's logic. And That's work. Because they... they I've always liked Steve Austin. Steve Austin's always, I've always thought he was and good. And Sean, for me, Sean, for, I, I knew Sean when I, what, my brother was in WWF back in the days. I went with my brother to a, uh, to the East Tour. Um, it was Rhode Island, Boston. I don't remember the other places. I went with him in 97, uh, right before I finished the high school. I went with him. And I knew all these guys in those days. You know, I was like, holy shit, I'm with fucking Undertaker, this, that. Everybody was there. It came Shamrock. That I used to, you know, watch his uh, UFC fights and stuff. <laughs> and I knew Sean, and Sean for me is one of the best wrestlers in the world, but he's an asshole. <laughs> I, I don't know how he is now. Yeah, for I, me, when I knew him, I told that guy he's an asshole. Well, I, my only really experience with Sean, like, I remember me and one man gang were getting ready to have a dark match. And Sean walked in, and like, don't give him anything, just beat the shit out of him. He goes, you didn't give me nothing when I started. Don't give him anything. And I was like, man, that kind of, you don't even know me. I, Who the fuck you think he is? I just, you know, to say that. I, this just, is, this repress, this I just felt bad. I was like, man, yeah, I, disrespectful, I'm, man. I'm just one of the boys fuck trying to get a job. And you ain't got to bury yeah. me right off the bat like that. But That's I don't know how he is now. But the, the worst, the, the click days. The, he, he was a complete asshole. 97, uh... I think 95 was when I lost my smile or whatever the fuck he said. You know, that's stupid. But still, one of the best fucking performers in the fucking in the square ring, circle, great. bro. He can, he can he can tell a fucking story. A story. And nowadays, a lot of guys, they can do a lot of great fucking moves. 
but they don't tell you a story. And you know, it, the wrestling, you know, they need needs that. The new guys, I think, you know, the way they teach you, the way uh, guys like you, it's my from my brother Butch, uh, Shane taught me a lot of things. Uh, Bison. It seems like now guys just want to get in the ring. Bing, 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 yeah. bing, bing, bing. And you know, it looks, it looks good, but do it with a purpose and tell a story in the ring. That that's the main focus that you have to have uh, like a wrestler you know uh, tell a story and, and you know sadly it doesn't happen but anyway and not about wrestling bro let's talk about the person because like I told como bueno let me go in Spanish como dije al principio el tipo es tremendo luchador pero es una tremenda persona dentro del luchador hay una tremenda persona un gran corazón bueno una buena persona y quiero hablar de eso ahora con él I was, I was talking about you know The wrestler is a great wrestler, but the person is a greater person, you know. And in your days in Puerto Rico, you stood here like, uh, how many years you live in this island? Like Let's seven? see. I think I was here maybe five straight years, and then I went home for like three months, and then I came back again, and I was back here for another couple of years. Yeah, like seven and eight years. And a lot of like you always hear there's guys that have come that have been down here some of the other American wrestlers have been down here and they thought oh you don't want to go down there it's, it's bad and all this and, and they want to knock it and I was like man I had a blast I had this is some of the most fun I had and never had problems with anybody everyone was cool with me and the houses were fucking the great. House, houses were great the and it uh, was good in the time and then I uh, it's one of those things you don't know what you got till it's gone. And then, because uh, I got th done things I shouldn't have been doing, but when I went home, because I got a little homesick, but when I got home, the very first winter, I thought to myself, what was I thinking? Because I had it made. It, 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 it was great. I, was, I have I had the time of my life down here. And in, in the time you came, you were Flash Flanagan, but I don't know if it was because of you or the office told you to change your name. And I know this guy is a big fan of uh, comics. And uh, especially oh, yeah. Star, Star, Star Wars. Wars, Star Wars, especially. But your name has to do a lot with comics. The name that people know here in Puerto Rico. Let, let me see. If it's true that the slash Venom, the Venom thing is because of the Spider-Man comic. No, no, no. Uh, I, uh, I was okay. living a fucking lie all the time. This is how I when I got down here, uh, Luke was like, "Mate, you mind if we change your name?" Uh, like as long as I got a check each week, and call me whatever you want to call me. And then he's like, "We're gonna call you Slash uh, Furnum Vernum uh, Venom Venom Venom." And I'm like, "All right, Slash Venom it is." And then <laughs> so uh, the mate give you that name, yeah. Luke. Uh, as far as I know, all, all right. I know is that's the name they came up with, and they gave it to me. Like I'll make it work because at that moment, at that time, I'd just been released from WWE. And I wanted to stick it in their face and be like, all right, you guys are sitting there and, and didn't bring me up because I didn't have the six-pack abs and I wasn't a, a yeah. jacked-up muscle-bound guy. But I'm going to show you. I'm going to make myself into a star down here. And, and you did, bro. And, and, uh, you did. You, you, you I, know. I only wish the people in the States, See? I wish we could have had the world, the, the recognition all over that WWE has. Because, because the quality of the wrestling here... It was, I think, sometimes even better than in the States. The stuff that went on down here, I think, was some of the best stuff that was going on. I mean, it was great. I mean, you're in the same building every, th every almost every, every Saturday, Saturday night, day. and you're filling it with four or 5,000 people and on a weekly basis. Yeah. And and you should, you should run, like, four days a week, five days a week. You know, it, it was hard. And every, every, everywhere was where it was a sellout. And then big show, the, come to the big shows. I mean, you're in the arenas, and you got 12, 14,000 people. That's sick. Hey. That's sick. You, know, you try an indie show to do that now. Yeah. Uh, no, nowadays, I no, nothing against, because I like it. The, the Cody Rose uh, thing, the all-in, they sell out 10,000 people. Say, we... IWA used to do that, you know, a Saturday <laughs> for a Saturday, you know, in a big show. Remember the the, the stadium of uh, in Carolina, uh, Roberto Clemente yeah. Stadium, the big huge motherfucker. That was a fucking sellout. The first time it rained like a pour like a motherfucker. I got in just uh, 
a couple months after that, and I'd heard of the stories how when Ricky's in the ring and, the, and he's doing well, the you, thing. You, and you went in the second, the second time you were there. Yeah, you were, and you know and, uh, that, that fucking place is huge, man. That place is huge. So and you know to have that feel, it's like it's big, big time. Back in the days, but you know after that. Now that I know that that the name, that the way your name came, is it was a lie, and I, I was. I don't, hey, it could have been. I don't know. All, all right, know maybe I gotta ask Moody. Moody used to used to was supposed to be here, but you know he couldn't make it. Moody, we love you, man. Cabron. <laughs> well, he loves you. <laughs> um, Should be here, Moody. This guy, I know that you're a big, big animal lover, and I know for a fact that. In your days in Puerto Rico, you used to come to the arenas, and if you see dogs on the streets, you go over there, you play with them, you give them food or water or whatever, yeah. and you took some of them to your house to live with you. And and people saw that in you, that even nowadays, as we speak, one of the persons that used to work in the IWA gave you a puppy, and it's still with you 14 years later. Still with me. And then there was a... I went to a... There was a I can't remember the grocery store... Uh, I can't remember the name of it, but someone had threw the mother cat, a kitten. The mother cat was dead, but they threw a kitten and a puppy in the trash can. And I could hear them, so I climbed over the fence, and they had the barbed wire around it. And I remember climbing over the fence, I broke the fence, and I fell down, and I had a piece of glass stuck in my knee. But uh, I got the puppy and the kitten out, and I took them home, and fed them, and I found them at home. I was like, man, how could you take an animal and throw them in the dumpster? Yeah. That's just wrong. Yeah, that's wrong. Yeah. And, and I remember the, the story because we were talking on the way to, to be here about the, the, the dog you used to have, a shithead. The name is funny, but, you know, it was cool. And the dog was cool. And, and I remember that you shave him, and, but you leave him like a lion. The, you know, the neck part was with hair and the rest was, was trim. Shed for sure. <laughs> but it was a cool dog. And, you know, you love it and you found him at home. You know, and, and it takes guts, you know, the, the way you think about animals and Because a lot of people here in, the, in Puerto Rico and even in the States and every, everywhere in the world treats animals like, like, like shit. And, you know, that's, that's wrong, you know. We, we don't think like that. Uh, for, for you, I know that for you, for me. And the animal will be loyal to you where people that you know will stab you in the back. Yeah, and man. I would that's, have that's fucking that's true, bro. Loyal to you. Than <clears throat> someone that you, were, you were talking to me that one of your dogs... Uh, you were you were in the park with the with the dog, and a pit bull attacked your dog, and it already happened yeah, in, by the neck. And you, well, a, you all told the story. Had a, the, my dog was out playing, and the pit bull snatched the hood, he had it over his head, had my dog's head in his mouth. So I jumped on the pit bull and grabbed his mouth, and I'm sitting there prying on the mouth, trying to keep him because he wanted to jerk around and snap his neck. And I so I'm I'm holding the pit bull down, trying to get his, to keep his mouth from doing anything, and my dog's yelping trying to get away. And uh, they threw water on him. And when they threw the water on the dog, he let go. My dog took off running and boom, jumped him back in the car. And I was like, man, he's lucky he didn't kill my dog. If he had done my dog, I would have not only killed his dog, but probably him. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. Something, something will happen. And then uh, I let my dog out of the car one time. He just took off running because he seen this other dog and, and again another pit bull. No, he got PTSD from pit bulls. <laughs> no, <laughs> he wants to play with the dogs he shouldn't play with. And, okay, and he he's hates, a player. He he likes to play and have fun. He doesn't. Want, he won't play with little dogs. He, All right. he hates little dogs. He likes big dogs to play. But he'll he'll go mess jump on a big dog and it's like. But man, that that's that you know that's so cool about you that. That you love uh, animals and you have rescued a lot of animals here in Puerto Rico and probably in the States you, you do the same when when you have the chance, you know, because it's a great thing to do. Right now I got a big dog near my neighborhood, I always give him water and food and you know, he's now he lives he sleeps in, in my fucking front of my house and he, he guards every, all the house and you know every I pet him and stuff. Hey bring me some food. Yeah, I always he <laughs> al, he always got food and everybody had I see him in the neighborhood and now like three people give him food every fucking day. He he eats better than us, bro. You know? Yeah. And he's loyal, you know, got, that's that's cool. I gotta cook for my dog. I put dogs you, down. You cook for your dog? Yeah, he looks at it like I'm not eating that. And then I guess so I gotta cook him something, then he'll eat it. Bam! He won't eat dog food. And then uh, dog treats, I can take him to the bank and uh, they'll give him treats there. He'll gobble them up. I give him treats at home, he just looks at me like, I'm not eating that. But if I take the treats that I bought him, put them in my pocket, go to the bank, and act like I'm pulling them out of the tube, <laughs> then he, boom, gobbles it down. I, I don't know what it is. He and just, you're telling me that, that your dog has, has heat with your girlfriend? Hates her. 
<laughs> he, she moved in on his territory. Yeah, and it's like, you know, and you know, he don't play that. No. But <laughs> man, it's it's such a great you know time to to talk and and thank you for take the time. You know, he's got a show like in an hour, and we're talking here. He's but. That's what friends do, you know. And I'm so glad to see you, to talk to you, that you have been in my podcast. Because I know a lot of people, you know, they, they still uh, remember you. They miss you. They love you. And, and and it's a cool thing, you know, to have great friends in, in, in your show. And thank you for, for accepting, you know. Because I'm still retired. I'm going to keep that way. Even you say the, the, the other thing. It feels good, man. You should try someday. It feels great on your body. But anyway, man, slash... I don't know, probably, you know, the people want to talk about the the incident of the, the, the Ricky when he threw you. And and a lot of people ask me that, and I, I said, like, man, he can't talk about much of that because he don't remember. But, you know, <laughs> that tries to give me your, your glimpse of that. When I got thrown off the balcony, I actually thought I went through the table. I thought I went through the table, and I had no idea what went on after that. And then, uh... After when after I watched it on video, I was like, "Oh my god!" Because you, uh, you were in the rock, locker room when you woke up. No, I woke up out there. I think because I I can remember going you through the hallway. Your eyes, but you didn't woke up. You were not out. Well, I was out, but you uh, concussed, bro. when I came to, when I walked back in the locker room, I thought I was thought I was fine. But when I went to the hospital, they checked me out, and you're fine. And because uh, if you watch it slowly, you see I landed on my head. Yeah, literally. And then uh. Like, good thing I landed on that yeah. thing. Hey, some some question I remember. Have you ever worked in Japan? No. No? No. You ever wish to work in Japan? No. No? You don't like Japan? That was my dream. I, I, I always wanted to go to Japan. That was my... Like, my, like, yeah. my all I ever wanted to do was either work for WWE or WCW. I wanted to, be, wanted to wrestle WWE, and I did, but... Uh, I... One of those things, it, to me, it's their loss. Yeah, and, and it's true, man. You're you're still a great talent, still a great person, you know. And now you're here again in Puerto Rico. You know, it's it's hot, great to have to have you here. You know, a lot of people love you, still remember you. It's and, nice to be somewhere where they respect you, than be somewhere where they're stabbing you in the back every minute. Yeah. So. Yeah, that's fucking true, man. It's fucking true, and man. Thank you for being my guest today. Hey, thanks for having me. I hope you have a fucking good match today. You you turn the house down like you always do. And, you know, I'll see you in the next one. I know I know we're going to see you in this island once again a couple of times. I hope I hope for it. I hope more than a couple of times. <laughs> Bro, thank you for, hey. for being here. Man, eh, gracias por estar viendo este nuestro programa. Sabe que nos pueden ver por nuestra aplicación en, en de Apple, de, de podcast en iHeartRadio también. No se pueden suscribir a nuestro canal en YouTube. Gracias a Glatzy Bailetti. Esto ha sido un episodio más de la vuelta con mi amigo Flash Flanagan, aka Slash Fucking Venom, el hombre de goma. Este es un episodio más. Ya saben, la vuelta a PR. No se pueden suscribir. Hasta la próxima y muchas gracias. Tú no ves que aquí el gallo soy yo.